I think I'm live. Actually, I can see some comments up there. Three, two, one, countdown. G'day, everybody. How are you going? It's good to be here. I'm just going to hang for a few minutes and have a bit of a chat quickly before we get started tonight. Um, you'll notice on the screen I've got a, um, a link to download because if you haven't already, I've created... I've, you can see that. Sorry. I've created um, some course notes. Sorry, I'm looking weird in the green screen. Um, but I've created some course notes uh, for tonight's uh, soft plastics training and teaching. So if you're able to uh, use that link, make sure that you download the course notes because that'll be helpful uh, while we're having a discussion uh, during the training. Um, and also it gives you a hard copy. It gives you something that you can have for later as a reference and a resource. So I'll probably, I'm going to mention that a few times because as other people join, then I'm going to, um, no, 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 that's just showing up there. Um, as other people join, I will just mention these notes again uh, and the download so that as many people as possible can um, get the notes. And I'm just looking over here in the comments. I can see Leonardo, Freddie. Good to see you, Freddie. Bevan. Honky, Honky Kong. A few different dudes. Edit Suite. Manfred. Bevan. Hang on, Bevan's... Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm from down the road at Batemans Bay. Awesome. Chad Brown. Trevor. Oh, Trevor's there. G'day, Trevor. Okay, cool. Well... And it's great to see new people joining Rogers Fishing. Uh, we've actually got members from different states around Australia, which is really awesome. It's great to get input from fishermen in different parts of Australia and to be able to share knowledge with each other. And also, uh, in the instance, if any of us travel interstate, it means that through the Rogers Fishing community and membership that we can actually have contacts in other states, which is fantastic. So... It's good to see new people joining um, and becoming part of our group uh, so that we can actually have more collective knowledge, uh, be able to inspire each other with our awesome pastime. Okay, I can see Aussie Nebula there. That's fantastic. Greg, Jeffrey Morfitt, a whole bunch of dudes. Awesome. Mother Hen. Wow, Mother Hen. G'day from QLD. You know, I actually... I've got pretty good eyesight, really good eyesight actually for my age, but I may need these. <laughs> Sorry about that. I may need these when it comes to reading my notes a little bit later. I try to minimise using these because I want my eyes to stay strong. I want to use them. Okay, so just a reminder that I have the link uh, on that side of the screen. I have got the link to the course notes for tonight. Uh, hopefully that works as a link uh, on your computer. I wasn't unable to test it today. Other than that, you could just type that link in and you'd be able to download the soft plastics course notes for tonight. Okay, well, let me have a look here. Um, okay, lots of more comments, which is fantastic. All right, okay. Let's going to try clicking on one. Oh, there you go. I'm learning how to do this. Freddie, he lives in West Hoxton. Hoxton, awesome, Freddie. Great to see. Okay. Oh, wow. Look at that. This guy here. We've got Adam from Mount Gambier in South Australia. That's cool. Awesome. Okay. Okay, Freddie's back again. I look good with the glasses. Thank you, Freddie. All right. So, um,. Yeah, just an, uh, an encouragement if you're thinking of joining Rogers Fishing. We're really looking at developing a great community of uh, help, helpful people, fishermen who want to inspire each other. So consider doing that. Uh, the doors are actually open now. They haven't been open for about two months, but um, I'm open. I can uh, take some new members into Rogers Fishing. So if you're considering joining, that would be awesome. And remember the download. So now what I'm going to do, I've just got a short presentation uh, where I'm just talking about a few fishing things and also um, just giving you a little bit of background about myself. So I'm just going to go over into that 
And then after that, I'm going to come back to the screen and we're going to start going through the training for tonight. And while we're going through the training, I'd really like, it'd be great to get participation from you guys because I want to help you the best way I can with your soft plastics fishing. So I'm going to be asking you to give me your questions during, during the training. And then later, after the training um, is finished, we'll also be having a general Q&A time where I'll be able to answer as many questions as possible. So I will be back in a few minutes and um, see you shortly. Well, welcome to tonight's training where we're going to be doing soft plastic basics. This is actually really important because I know a lot of people struggle with confidence when it comes to soft plastics and really they are awesome. I love fishing with soft plastics and we're going to be doing this beginner's guide tonight where we just cover really key fundamental things all around soft plastics. But before we get into that, I just want to ask you a few questions. So tonight we're going to be doing soft plastics basics and then afterwards we're going to have a live Q&A session where I will be staying on live to answer your questions uh, as long as possible. I'm happy to stay and hang around as long as you are keen to learn. So you are in the right place tonight watching this. If you've spent hundreds of dollars on fishing gear but you don't know where to start. I think there's a lot of people in that position and it's not that much fun when you have the desire but you just need the right information. Also, you're in the right place if you would like to consistently catch fish. And that certainly is the goal of every single one of us. Now, the average fisherman spends a lot of money on fishing tackle, and we're just going to have a really quick look at that um, because we don't realise it certainly adds up. And my boat shed looks like a fishing tackle shop. It's got so much stuff in it. Um, I'm quite sure I'd be shocked if I added up all the cost of everything that I've spent on fishing tackle. So this is typically just a list of things uh, basic expenses that someone may spend setting themselves up to go fishing. This is a list of um, just basic things that I put together for beach fishing, but whether it's beach fishing or fishing in the estuaries for soft plastics, it's likely to be similar. And you can see just in this example, it's amazing how quickly that money adds up. And that doesn't even include things like petrol, in your car, um, all sorts of other things that would be added to that list. So, a lot of people spend all of this money on equipment, but they don't know where to fish. They don't know when to fish. They don't know which lure. In the case of soft plastics, it's like, what is the best soft plastic to buy? What shape should I get? What color? Um, there's so many different soft plastics on the market. And also, with soft plastics, what jig head should I use? What size hook should I use? How heavy should the jig head be? And, and why is that? So I get, um, I meet a lot of fish, fishermen, not fishermen, sorry about that, um, who are like this guy, who are just a bit frustrated, would just really like to be able to get results. And a lot of them reach out to me for help. Now it's only been just in the last couple of years that I started making instructional videos on YouTube. Initially I started making videos on beach worming because that's something that I absolutely love and I knew that a lot of people were interested to learn. But that obviously led into making uh, fishing videos. And I just found that there weren't many videos on YouTube that actually really taught people. And my goal with my videos is my videos are not what you'd call brag videos where it's like, look at me, catch all these fish. My whole purpose of a video is to be able to impart information 
in a way that you can actually get it simply and apply it and become successful with your fishing. And I get a lot of satisfaction. It's amazing because I never really knew that I'd be doing this, but I get so much satisfaction from doing that. And I get a lot of really great feedback. And I've got several videos now that have had more than 300,000 views. And lots of comments like this one from a guy here who said he's, he says he's been looking for years for someone to explain the fundamentals of beach fishing in detail and accidentally came across this absolute gold of a video. Thank you so, so much, mate. You have no idea how happy you've made me. That sort of comment really inspires me to be better at what I do, to do more videos and also to, you know, just make them the best that I can. And I actually have a lot of comments like that. I had some just epic comments, which um, if you're one of those guys who's left a comment like that, I really appreciate it because it certainly inspires me to continue to do more videos. And it's led me to become a professional beach worming guide. And here's a couple of shots of just a couple of some of my clients uh, where I go beach worming. So I still do that. Um, it's not my main focus, but I am happy to do beach worming guiding uh, and also as a fishing guide as well. But I really like to devote most of my time to making videos because I can help more people by making videos than I can by spending one day uh, with just one or two people. So I would rather, I think it's a better investment of my time creating instructional material where I can help a lot more people. Now this is just a short video of a gentleman named Ken who reached out to me from YouTube and just knew nothing about beach fishing at all. And he didn't even know how to cast properly. So just have a quick look at Ken. So I hold it like that. And, and it went about 10 feet. Great. Now Ken, were you seriously trying then? I was. You were? <laughs> Yeah, I was. It didn't look like it. <laughs> Roger, get me off the camera. I'm embarrassing myself. Come and tell me what I need to do. All right, Ken. Okay. Come and tell me what I need to do. Now, Ken, yeah, that's it. Wind it in. <laughs> At least I know how to do that part. Uh, that's so funny, you know. Um, I put that large float on the end of the line because um, if you're practising casting, it helps to be able to see, you know, if you had a small synchron or something, it's harder to tell where it's going. But if I've got a big thing on there like that, it can actually, it helps when he's learning how to cast. But he actually improved his casting a lot, very quickly. Then this was Ken actually catching his first fish off the beach. He'd never caught a fish off the beach before. And this is his. What do you got on there? I have no idea. <laughs> What have you caught? What have I caught? <laughs> Ken, that's your first fish off the beach. Oh, look at this. Look at the size of that. Wow, look at that. That's bigger than my one. <laughs> wow, look at that. I mean, I thought yours was large when you brought it in. Now in comparison, look at that. Oh, what a classic. Um, I actually had Ken's drag pretty light because when you've got a beginner, if a fish is pulling hard, they could potentially pull at the wrong time and actually either break the line or lose the fish. So when he was winding, he kept. He, I had to go over and keep tightening the drag a little bit because it was just going nowhere. All right, let's move on to the next one. Just a couple of quick shots from uh, my photo album. I've got zillions of photos of fish that I've caught, but this is just a big mulloway that I caught in my younger years. I've caught lots of Mulloway. Uh, this is just a great shot of one that I caught in the entrance of the Hawkesbury River, just out from Pitwater. And this is a couple of recent snapper shots. The one on the left-hand side is a snapper that I caught off the rocks using squid for bait. And the one on the right-hand side is a snapper that I caught fishing from a jet ski using soft plastics. So the one on the right-hand side was a soft plastic fish. Um, I went out on a mate's jet ski and got that. And this is just a, 
a 15 kilo kingfish that I caught in my younger years on relatively light line, just 10 kilo line, I landed that kingy, which is, um, if you know anything about kingfish, that's a, that's a reasonable effort. Okay, so my goal tonight with our training is to take you from using soft plastics with the basic training that I'm giving you tonight with the end goal of catching some fish like that picture on the right hand side. That picture is just an hour or so's fishing with soft plastics in Burrill Lake on the New South Wales South Coast. So I actually caught three snapper, a brim, and two flathead that morning, just flicking a few soft plastics. So it just goes to show you, even when you're just targeting flathead in a lake, you can get a little bit of variety uh, in your species. So I just would like to ask you a quick question or a couple of questions. Where are you on your fishing journey? Are you a dreamer? You have the vision of yourself catching great fish but need clear direction. Maybe that's you. Or are you what I call a newbie? You're a complete beginner and have started but lack knowledge. There's so many people in that position because it really comes down to having the right information uh, and the right strategy. Or perhaps you are a tryhard. Now, I think tryhards in my book are, an ab are absolute legends because you're someone who's committed and you're putting lots of time in, you're enthusiastic about your fishing, um, you're certainly not lacking motivation, but you're just not having the success that you'd like to have. So I think tryhards, my hats go off to tryhards. They're awesome. Or you are what I call a catcher. You're someone who's kicking some goals and you're catching a few fish, but you just would like to increase your skills and catch some, you know, some more trophy fish or actually just increase the quantities of fish that you're catching. So the end goal is to be a skilled angler. That's what the end goal is for all of us when we're fishing. And certainly once you become a skilled angler, there's, there's a lot of satisfaction and pleasure and enjoyment that comes out of being skilled at going fishing, just the sheer enjoyment of it, but also coming home with a great feed. So how do we get there? How do we, how do we become a skilled angler? Well, the greatest need a fisherman is knowledge and strategy. We can have all the equipment and all the gear, but we don't. if we don't have the intelligence and the right information, we can just struggle and we can go out and catch, you know, no fish or just really end up spending a lot of time doing trial and error. And that's where doing something like what you're doing tonight um, with the teaching that I'm just about to bring to you you know, certainly doing this is going to help you to be more successful. So now I'm just going to come back to the camera live and I'm going to be getting into doing this teaching on soft plastics uh, live on camera. I'm back. I'm glad that I'm learning about technology. I'm glad that you're very patient with that. Okay, awesome. So, um, now that we're back, we're going to get started in our soft plastics teaching. So if you haven't already, or if you're able, it'd be great for you to don download the uh, training notes, which are on the screen with that link on the screen. I've got the notes here uh, that I prepared earlier in the week. So um, you can have them for later, or you, it's great if you can have them now while we're going through, because I'm going to be reading through some of these points uh, that I put in the training. Just going to have a look at the comments here. Look, it's great to see everyone's comments. It's awesome. I'm loving that. Thank you so much. I can see there's a lot of tryhards there. Uh, I reckon tryhards are awesome. <laughs> I love tryhards. Okay, so I'm just having a quick look. Um, okay, I'm just going to click on this this comment. So we got, okay, Midnight Oil Best Lure. Midnight Oil. Motor Oil is a really good um, flathead one, the Z-Man Motor Oil. Cool, okay. Motor oil, yeah. That's right, you've come back and said motor oil. 
Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, where do you find my courses? I have fishing courses that I've created on the Rogers Fishing website, uh, which are included in um, your membership. And I sell those courses individually, but it's way cheaper just to be a member and, and hang out with everybody else. And so that's where the courses are. Um, okay, so I'm going to get into the notes. I've actually got quite a few packets of some of the soft plastics that I use, um, different ones um, I'm going to show you. So in my notes here, if you've got them, uh, what the first thing we're looking at is your tackle or your gear set up for soft plastic fishing. Now, what we're talking about in tonight's training is really fishing um, in rivers and lakes, in estuaries. So this is not offshore fishing for snapper. It's more fishing in lakes and rivers. So typically the setup that I use is I use a, a rod a, approximately six foot, six, six foot six in length, rated one to three kilos. When you're fishing in lakes and rivers, light tackle is so much fun. You don't need a heavy setup. It's really awesome using light gear. So you just need a light, small rod. Uh, and that's whether you're fishing in a boat or off the land. And I use a two and a half thousand size reel. I know that the brands of reels vary a little bit in the size of a two and a half thousand size reel. And I would recommend to spool it with eight pound braid as a main line. Um, and I mean, you could use eight pound fluorocarbon leader. You could do eight pound main and eight pound leader. That's, that's not a bad combination. I think that's a good all round um, combination for beginners. Because you can go, I mean, I've fished a lot lighter than that, that, that I've fished with two kilo line with soft plastics and caught a lot of fish. But um, I'm just going to have a look in the comments here. Okay. Yes, that's right. Um, just put this one. That PDF is only one page. That's right. Yes. It's just a, it's just a one page list of basic information. Sorry. So hard to see that. All right. Okay. All right, just checking the notes. All good. Lee Wood, can you put together a list? Oh, sorry, Lee, I'm just going to click on your comment. Can you put together a list of your plastics for the various fish species, including jig heads and the like? Lee, I'm going to show you a few things tonight. Um, I've got some plastics here, and I'm going to talk about jig heads. So, yep, I'm going to do that. All right. So we're going to get into it. We're just talking about the size rod and reel. You only need a light rod and reel. And... I mean, I think if you had six pound line, you're going to land a lot of fish on six pound line. And I'll just quickly talk about for a moment. I'm recommending eight pound braid and, and leader because you're going to still catch brim. And if you hook slightly larger flathead, you've got a little bit more um, tolerance, a little bit more leeway, a little bit more chance of landing a, a, a bigger fish if it swallows the plastic uh, right down its throat. But if you fish with lighter line, or if you fish with a lighter leader, you might, I mean, if you're willing to go as low as four pound, but when you use a lighter leader, you catch a lot more brim. As your line gets heavier, you catch less brim. It makes very little difference with the flathead because, you know, you could use 10 pound and the flathead are just going to take it anyway. But if you want to get a bit more variety in your catch, then the lighter line means that you catch more brim and snapper. In a lot of instances, you can catch snapper. I'm just just going to check the... Uh, <laughs> sorry, am I going to play Minecraft? Okay, I'll use a Black Queen Deluxe. What's that? Adam Dixon says, I use a Black Queen Deluxe 2 to 6 kilo, 3,000 series reel, 10 pound mono. Okay, well, that's, that's more what I'd call more a flathead set up um, and you probably still get the occasional brim but you definitely catch a lot more brim on the lighter line uh, I use okay I might just hold off on the comments for a minute uh, I'm going to talk about jig heads just for a minute with the soft plastics I pretty much my standard size jig head is a 1 8 1 0 some people like to use a slightly smaller hook but a 1 8 jig head um, I hardly use anything else, actually, when I'm fishing in the lake. Um, 
the only reason you vary the weight of your jig, jig heads is mainly due to the depth of the water and the drop time. Because if you've got a lighter jig head and you start fishing in water that's deeper, like five, six, eight metres deeper, it obviously takes longer for your soft plastic to get to the bottom, which a lot of people like because it's, you've got more what you call drop time where the lure is, is moving and you've got the action of the lure in the water. It just depends on your patience levels. But there's a balance um, between the weight of the jig head and the depth of the water. However, I find a one-eighth jig head. I've got one here. Um, uh, I'll bring this over here. I'm holding it in front of my shirt so you can see it a bit better, actually. So that this is a one-eighth. Looks quite big. With a, that's a, Sorry, I'll move that around. That's a 1.0 hook. Yeah, just going to try and get it so you can see it. I use that heaps. I catch so many fish on a 1.8 jig head with a 1.0 hooks. Awesome. I like to make sure that there's enough hook protruding out of the soft plastic because different soft plastics have different um, profile thicknesses and profiles. And some of them, if you use a smaller hook, you know, I just think you've got to have a little bit more barb sticking out. So I find that that's a really good size. I'm just looking over here in the, in the comments. Okay. Where, okay. Just see Bazooka here says, I love catching yellowfin brim on six pound leader in shallow water. Yeah, that, that's, that would be awesome. Okay. Just going to quickly look at a couple of other comments. Okay. Okay, cool. My two outfits for estuary are six pound and eight pound line, so I'm happy to hear your recommendations. Okay. Um, cool. I catch more barramundi. Oh, wow, that'd be awesome. I don't live where the barramundi are. I live down south, so. Okay, so you talk about more time in the strike zone. Yep. Okay, all right. So let's just uh, keep moving on. So. I, I could use a, a size one hook. I'm just going to, sorry, take that, Mr. Bazooka. I'll just remove you for a minute. I'll move that back over there. You could use a smaller hook, but I really like the one eighth jig head. I rarely go heavier. The lake where I live, um, the deepest part is 11 meters, and I might use a one sixth, maybe. I still use the one eighths, even in 11 meters of water. Um, so that's a, a jig head there. I don't really use lighter much. You'd only use a lot of jig head. Gosh, you'd be fishing in, you know, one one or two metres of water. You'd use a really light jig head. Okay. Now, um, on my notes here, point number three is choose your location. Now, when it comes to soft plastic fishing, there's lots of great options for land-based fishermen. I mean, some of us have boats, but not everybody has a boat. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't have a lot of fun and catch a lot of fish if you don't have a boat. You can, because those of you who do some soft plastic fishing, you know that even guys in boats fish close to shore and cast a lot of their plastics to the shore, pulling the plastics out away from the shore, from the shallows over the drop-off. So when it comes to choosing your location... We're mainly talking about fishing in rivers, lakes, and even harbour, or like bays, where there's sandy bays, etc. And you can fish from the shore, which is awesome. Now, along with choosing your location, number point number four here is choose your terrain. Now, I'm in the middle of making a, a video on how to find flathead at the moment because, you know, we can have all the stuff, but where do we find flathead when we're fishing for flathead? I'll just very quickly talk about that for a second. When it comes to finding flathead, we need to ask a couple of questions. One question is, the first question is, how do flathead feed? And very quickly, with how flathead feed, we know that they are a flat fish, we know that they are a bottom dweller. When you look at a flathead, their underside is white, the top side is camouflage colour, and they spend uh, probably 98% of their life, they don't only stay on the bottom, but they probably spend 98% of their life on the bottom. So they, we know they are an ambush predator, 
predator, which means that they sit stationary in a stationary position on the bottom and they are waiting for their food to come to them. And so, and, they, and as we know, they've got eyes in the top of their head. They're a strange looking fish, but I think they're an amazing fish. Just quickly looking over the comment. Okay. I'm just going to try and keep up with the comments as best I can um, while we're going through the material. All right. Okay. All right. I just might leave that for the moment. Uh, okay. I'm just going to. Okay. Rare Rosie. Up on the mid north coast, I mainly use a 1 8 1 0 fishing for jacks. Okay. Get heaps of bread and butter fish too. Fantastic. That's awesome. Really good. Okay. I mean, that's something. That's a benefit of fishing or living in that area because um, I'd love to catch mangrove jacks. They, they look so very strong. Very, I know they're very powerful fighters, the mangrove jacks. Okay. So when it comes to choosing terrain for flathead, we need to consider how they feed, that they're an ambush predator, and then we need to think about, well, where are the most likely places that they are going to feed? So how do they feed and where do they feed and two of the main places that you catch flathead is next to weed banks in a lot of our estuaries you have weed banks of ribbon weed and that ribbon weed is on the edge of sand you'll have a weed bank that then beyond the weed bank you have sand and those weed banks are amazing ecosystems of life full of little prawns and baby fish, all sorts of little creatures. And flathead love lying on the sand at the uh, right adjacent to weed banks because all of those little goodies come swimming out of the weed banks and the flatheads sit there really quite close to the weed banks with their camouflage lying in the sand and those unsuspecting little fish and prawns come along and the flathead just, they just grab them. So... Along the edges of weed banks are fantastic places to fish for flathead um, using soft plastics. And often when I've been casting, I'm on the shore and I'm standing in the weed bank and I flick my plastic out beyond the weed bank, I work it back towards the weed bank and then I've even had the flathead hit it over the weeds. So they've swum up where there's no weed beyond the weeds. They actually come up and follow the soft plastic into the weeds. So weed banks are special and weed banks are in most lakes and estuaries around Australia. Um, you might want to put a comment in there if that's the case. I'm pretty sure whether you live in Queensland, Victoria or wherever you live, that you're going to have sandbars and sections of ribbon weed and weed banks. And so Flathead absolutely love those weedy patches with sand in between. So that's one definite place where flathead hang out and another place is close to shore where you've got a transition from shallow water to deep water because the flathead are looking for small fish a lot of the small fish are close to shore around you know where there's uh, rocks and weed and food so a lot of the flathead position themselves quite close to shore where the shallow water starts to transition to the deep so very often you hook fish very close to shore. So at the moment we are, we're just talking about terrain. And if you're going to go soft plastic fishing for flathead, sorry, dropped my thing. Um, if you're going to go soft plastic fishing, fishing from the shore, you're going to be looking for sandbars, areas of where there are weed banks that transition onto sand. Um, and and really, you're going to be looking for sand bottoms, you know, where you've got a, the edge of a river. You might have some rocks and oysters on the shore, but you know that beyond the shore, it goes out into a sand or a mud bottom because the flathead like to bury themselves, position and hide, lying in wait for uh, their dinner to come along. Um, is this what I'm discussing so far? Are you finding this at all helpful? A lot of you guys would know this. But if you could just mention if any of this is, is helping you, any of this information. Um, I'm just going to read from my notes here. 
Oh, I've got here, flat out are ambush predators who lie in a stationary position waiting for their food to come to them. That is why plastics are so effective because you cover a lot of ground. So we can really see that, can't we? We can really see the great advantage of soft plastics because, I mean, anyway, this is just how I think anyway. Like when I'm down on the edge of a river or edge of the lake, you don't know, none of us really know where the, where the fish are. We know the likely places that they will be, you know. And so I might be standing on the edge of the lake and I've got a beautiful weed bank, I've got some sandy patches, but seriously, when you're looking at the water, you, you know, I mean, there could be 50 flathead out there in front of you, scattered here and there, but you really, you don't know where they are. So what do you do? You cast your soft plastic out, you work it back to your position. You might only cast one or two times in that direction. But if you haven't had a hit or a hookup, there isn't a, there's not a fish there. So, you know, you go, so like you, you work your way through the clock, you know, like 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. The idea is, is that you are prospecting and you're searching and you're testing to see where the fish are. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey, for that. Um, okay, I just want to say something. I just want to focus on this one. I caught a flutter yesterday and I used 0 and 8. Okay. Because only the current was taking my line too quick, so I needed to soft plastic to find the bottom faster. Yeah, good. Great, great comment, uh, Ron. Very good. Um, I just need to. That's it. Okay. So, where was I? So, you know, we all like to think we'd like to be like Superman. Imagine, I mean, I, I, we probably all think that, but imagine if you had x-ray vision and you could look at the water, it would probably blow your mind if you could actually see where all the different fish were positioned. But that's why we don't, and that's why when we've got the plastics, the beauty of it is is that we can, we can prospect and, and cast our, our plastics in different directions and then whew, we hook a fish, and as you know, very often there's more than one fish there might be a few hanging out in that particular spot. So I really enjoy that. I enjoy that part of soft plastic fishing. Aussie Nebula says, yep, thanks for your sharing, Roger. Okay, it's great to get that um, feedback from you guys. Thank you um, for that. That's awesome. So, yep, so just reading here again, that's why plastics are so effective. See, also, when you're fishing with uh, live bait, live mullet for flathead, I, I, I do similar things. When you cast out a live mullet, you've got that live fish swimming around and if there's a flathead probably within three or four metres radius, it's going to pick up, something's going on and you'll attract it. But once again, if I'm fishing with live mullet, if I don't get any um, hits for half an hour, I'll also move my live mullet around. I'll cast out a bit further, I'll cast in a little bit closer with the live mullet or I'll have two or three rods on the shore and do that. So just getting back to the notes. Um, so I've just said here, um, fish sandy areas because we know that flathead hide in the sand and their natural colour is, uh, you know, you find that flathead who, that are in clearer water are a lighter colour. They seem to be able to adapt. Whereas in the, the darker areas, you've got the darker, the dusky flathead go a darker colour. And then I've said here, look for shallow sandbars that transition into deeper water. And also look for weed banks near the shore with a sandy bottom beyond them. Now, that type of terrain is... Okay, sorry. Um, I heard a noise. Um, that type of terrain is consistent right along the coast of Australia. So tonight, uh, regardless of whether you're um, in Queensland or Victoria where, or where you are, um, our estuaries are all very similar. And while we're, while we're talking about flathead, we're not just talking about flathead because you catch some surprise fish when you fish with plastics and you do catch some really nice eating fish like and snapper as well. 
Um, I'm just going to come over here to the comments just to Ron again. What you've got to say, do flathead feed in groups as if you catch one, what's the likelihood there will be more around the same spot? Um, okay, well, while I have some knowledge of flathead, all I do know is that male flathead hang around female flathead and often... Uh, where there's a big female or a couple of females, there'll be a number of males or a number of other, a number of other fish around. So very often they are, you know, a lot of them are, are close together. So some, that very often happens when you're fishing with soft plastics that you'll hit a bit of a patch or a spot when you're testing and just locating where the fish are where you'll have a bit of success and you'll catch more than one fish. Um, I've been doing a little bit of a, an experiment this year with um, flathead that I've been keeping. I've been, um, you know, I normally just whip the, fill, the, whip the fillets off, but I've been just checking their, their sex, cutting them open, seeing if they're male and female. And, um, you know, they do, I, I do find even quite a lot of females in the, in the high 38, you know, high 30s and early 40s. Um, so you get female flathead, all the way up to the really big ones, which are, you know, people call big breeders, which they release, uh, which I've been releasing some of them as well. Um, but they do breed right across the um, the size range from, you know, 36 centimetres. We got one the other day, I think it was 36 centimetres or just on legal because it had swallowed the hook and it was a female. It, had, it was full of row at that size. Okay, so, so far we've looked at the, the gear setup. Um, we might actually move on to uh, lure selection, soft plastic selection. Now, I've brought in here with me tonight, I've just got some of the soft plastics out of my fishing uh, gear and ones that I use. Um, I'm not brand sensitive and I'm not promoting any particular brand of soft plastic, so I'm just showing you the packets of soft plastics that I have. Um, and you'll probably be familiar with a few of them. A few of them. Obviously, I've got some Berkleys. I've got some Z-Mans and, and uh, some Squidgies. You know, so there's various. There's so many different brands of soft plastics. But I want to show you a particular. Uh, some of the ones where I've caught a, a lot of fish on these particular plastics. Um, this particular one, I'm going to show you here. I, I'm going to try and make it so you can read it. Actually, sorry. It's a minnow smelt. Can you see how that looks like a mullet? Can you see that, how it's like silver on top and white underneath? It looks exactly like a potty mullet. And actually, I've got a slide here. I'm just going to bring it up on the screen. Um, and then I, I'm, you should still be able to hear me talking behind it. So... This is that uh, out of one of those lures out of that packet. And it just looks like a little mullet because it's like silver gray on top and white underneath. I'm just going to come back to my main um, thing. Um, you can see why you catch a lot of, a lot of fish on that because it looks exactly like a little mullet. <clears throat> and I've used these in two sizes. This one is 10 centimetre. Um, then there's another one which is smaller. It's about a 7 centimetre. Um, and they're, they're epic. Uh, seriously, snapper, brim and flathead love these. The only problem with these ones, as you know, is that they they don't last very long. Um, you get leather jackets and tailor and different things, bite them in half and you go through a packet in a session. They're not like the Z-Mans and the other ones, which are really uh, robust. So that's that's. if these were robust, it would be awesome. But uh, they are fantastic. I always, I always have them um, in my list of soft plastics all the time. In fact, I caught some fish yesterday on some of them. Um, also, um, this is another one here, uh, the Z-Man. Where am I? Uh, it's called an Easy Shrimp. And the colour is root beer chartreuse. And what's that say? That says it's a 3.5 inch or whatever that is. Um, I've got another image of that actually. I'll just bring it up. 
Um, that's uh, that's what that looks like. That's um, the root beer chartreuse prawn. And um, <clears throat> I've had good success with the with that with the flathead, uh, more so flathead than brim. The other one, which is a minnow, um, the one that looks like a mullet, the brim, love it. They just nail it. Okay, I'm just going to have a look at the comments for a second. Okay, mother hen. So so friend caught a jack at a local lake in two meters of water. Well, wow, okay. Maybe when, sometime when I come up to Queensland I can, uh, or Northern New South Wales, I can have a go for them. All right, so um, I just, um, just in answering this question, I don't really do fishing tours or anything like that. I, I don't do much fishing guiding. I do a little bit. Um, I get different people ask me, asking me. I teach people how to catch beachworms, so I do one-on-one -on -one beachworming sessions. And I do take people beach fishing, but it's not my main focus. I'm happy to do it, um, but I would much rather make videos because I can actually teach a lot more people on a video than I can one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So I prefer to um, I prefer to um, create um, just quality teaching videos as much as I can. Just have a quick look at the comments. Um, Jeffrey Morfitt says, can you also rig softly plastic to be weedless? Yes, you can. Absolutely, 100%. Um, I mean, I fish my local lake. There's, there's a lot of lakes in the area where I live. There's, the, the, the coast is just dotted with lakes. And they are, all of these lakes have quite a amount of weed in them. They have weed banks with sandy areas and etc. So I do encounter a fair amount of weed. Um, but it's not too much of an issue, even with a normal plastic. However, you can certainly rig weedless ones. Um, all right. Okay, so Phil Todd's asked a question here. He said, could you let me know what tide, tide or tides, morning or early evening? Um, I tend to fish myself, you know, not in the heat of the day. I tend to fish... Um, in the morning, in the you know, like the last couple of hours before dark, and you know, in the morning up until about 10 a.m. That's just the general time that, that I fish. Although sometimes I go out during the day and I still catch a few during the day as well. I'm not so focused on the tides in the lakes. I think tides would have more of an impact in rivers, um, because, for example, I live near Barill Lake, and there is some. I mean, it's open to the ocean all the time, but the lake movement in the lake is minimal. Um, there's only current in the main channel, and that's really just in the last hour or so of the running tide. Okay, so just going over here. All right. So, all right, okay. Which plastic were you talking about, Rare Aussie? Okay, for the jacks. DX Gamer, where can I go on your trips? That's right. Where do you do your beach worm trips? I'm located on the um, south coast of New South Wales near Ulladulla, so I mainly teach people in the, my local area. I used to live at Narrabeen on the northern beaches in Sydney, so I used to do beach swimming lessons on Narrabeen Beach, Mona Vale Beach, Warrywood Beach, Newport Beach, which are all great beach swimming beaches. And sometimes I go to Sydney, and when I'm up in Sydney, if I'm able, I'm happy to give people um, some beach rowing lessons when I'm up in Sydney, but I'm not in Sydney that much at the moment. All right, now I'm just going to get back to... So, so far, I've showed you the, um, the minnow, which I love the minnows. And often what I do when I'm looking to buy soft plastics... I'll get that out of my head, sorry. Um, when I'm looking to buy soft plastics, because these mullet impersonations work so well, I also check out anything that I can find in Z-Man or some of the other brands that replicate a mullet because that's just a no-brainer when it comes to flathead. Um, I've had good success on on the old, uh, I call it Gary Glitter. These are called, uh, where are we? Um, 
Uh, it's called. Hang on, I'll read it. It's called Gold Glitter. Gold Glitter. I just call it Gary Glitter. Gold Glitter. Um, these are a squidgy wriggler. Um, actually, I've got a, I've got a wriggler in my photos over here that I did. I'll have a look and see if I've got a wriggler there. No, I don't. Um, but but essentially, you know what a wriggler looks like. Oh, sorry, I'll bring that over there, over here. It's um like that. They're fantastic because the tail action on them is awesome. Um, I love it. You know, when you put it in the water and you just let it, and you watch it, and you just let it fall. You can just see the, you know, the tail wiggling so much. It's such an attractor for fish. So the good old gold glitter or Gary glitter, that's a proven, uh, a proven plastic. You guys have probably got heaps that you could um, you could share with me as well. So I've got that one. Um, so we looked at those other two. Here we've got the good old um, motor oil. Um, the Z-Man motor oil, that catches so many flathead uh, brim. Uh, I've got a mate who's called Big Whiting on um, on the motor oil. Um, I'll get one of them out. Okay, just looking over here in the comments. Okay, Brian. G'day, Brian. How are you, mate? Um, Brian says, here in the Swan River, Perth, is a lot of blowfish which kill soft plastic, so the metal vibes vices do very well on flathead. Okay, well, that's um, that's good. Good feedback, Brian, um, because, yeah, it's just, I did hear that, and you mentioned it another time, that there's a lot of uh, toadfish, blowfish or toadfish uh, in WA, which is, um, they're a pain, those things. Oh. I've been getting a few in my mullet, trap, mullet traps lately when I've been um, putting my mullet traps out, but I don't think I get as many as you get over in WA, so I'm just going to take that down there. Um, so this is that motor oil one uh, by Z-Man. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's uh, like, you know, it's a legendary flathead catcher. Very successful. I would still use with this particular size. This one is um, two and a half inch. I would still use the, um, the 1018 in the areas that I fish. Or you could go from a 1-0 down to just a size 1. The, um, the jig heads that I've got, once again, I'm not brand sensitive. I'm not advertising anything. Oh, it's, look, the colour looks weird, doesn't it? The colour's not showing out. Um, what are they called? They're called headhunters. Oh, yeah. Herd, yeah, headhunter. Headhunter lures. All right. But, yeah, so there's the motor oil one. That's another one that works well. Then I've got, actually, I'm just going to go over here to another picture. I'm sure, oh, no, that's that prawn. Then we're going to look at this um, this prawn. I'm sure some of you have used these little prawn ones. They're a gulp prawn. But it's amazing how successful they are as well um, in different colours. I've caught a lot of flathead with the, um, you know, the classic nuclear chicken color in the prawn which is not very natural looking but um, I've caught a lot of flathead and brim on these little prawn gulp prawns okay all right I'm just going to come back up to where am I yeah just going to come back on there okay so going to have a look at the comments again Okay, all right, so it's going to bring up Jeffrey again. Jeffrey's just reminding us about using the lure scents that come with the soft plastics. Now, I'll be, you know, I'll be honest, I've never used a lure scent yet. So I, um, and, and me saying that doesn't mean I'm saying they don't work or anything. I just haven't been in the habit of using a lure scent. I just have just used just straight plastics and I've caught a lot of fish. So maybe if I started putting scent on my plastics, I might catch more. But I certainly have had no shortage of fish without having a touch of scent on any of my soft plastics. So um, I don't know. It probably does work really well. It's something I'll – and purely I haven't done it because it's just a habit thing. I just haven't done it. I, uh, I bought soft plastics that come with the scent. But that's just a little bit of feedback from me. Um, 
on that. Um, I've got mates who won't fish without scent on their soft plastics. They always use a scent. Um, so that's just my little bit of feedback on that. Yep, okay. Chef BK Malik, I saw your video and it's so great. I wonder which one that was. Okay. Okay, so also um, Ron asked the question about scent, but me, I've never used it. I've never used scent. I've been using soft plastics for about 15 years um, consistently, and I haven't used it in 15 years. Maybe maybe I've got a lot to learn in, um, in, in um, putting the scent on. Uh, okay, all right, so... All right, so I'm just going to put this one up from Peeling Line. I can't bring myself to use soft plastics. There's enough plastic in the water already. I catch fish to eat. Not sure what the effect will be long term on the fish if I get bitten off. Um, peeling Line, I I don't think there's, um, personally, I don't think there's a great deal of, um, you know, because really, I don't think you really lose many plastics in the water. Um, I don't. Um, I know that some of the other ones which are bitten off easily break down quickly and I don't think they really do. I wouldn't think there'd be much harm to the fish, but I rarely lose soft, lose, lose soft plastic. So I think that that's probably minimal, minimal concern. Only from my own experience, I haven't had much of a problem with it. Um, and certainly the brands which are super tough, you can fish with them and then go home and they're still on your line and they, you know, all the Z-Man ones last for ages. So I can understand uh, what you're saying, peeling line, but I don't think it's a really, really bad problem. I think it's probably pretty minor and a really, really small percentage uh, where that would be a problem. Okay. All right. Well, I've answered your question about sense, Rick. Um, Sorry, I don't mean to be doing. I'm not trying to do business or anything with with. I'm just answering questions with the worms. I've got a website, beachworming.com.au, and my contact details are on my website, beachworming.com.au. I've got two websites. I have rogersfishing.com, which is a, like an online fishing club and a membership site. Um, and that reminds me, just to encourage anyone who's thinking of joining, we really would love to have some more enthusiastic f fishermen join Rogers Fishing, so that we can have more uh, input and certainly the members who are already in Rogers Fishing are having an excellent time and really benefiting a lot from all their collaborative knowledge. Um, so, and Rogers Fishing is open for membership right now so you could join tonight if that was something that you'd like to do. Okay, so just... Um, Okay, so I'll just mention this. I'm just putting up a few of these comments because, um, you know, it can help all of us. So Dragging Me Down says here that he likes the weedless jig heads because they get through weed patches, no worries. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Uh, it's really good feedback. Uh, thank you for that, Dragging Me Down. Okay, and Jeffrey says he uses S-Factor Scent. All right, I might just get back to my notes for a minute. So we've talked a little bit about terrain, uh, about how flathead are stationary. We can all agree that they are a stationary ambush feeder who position themselves in places where there's going to be food, little fish, prawns and different things, which is often in quite shallow water and on the edges of um, where water transitions from shallow to deep and weed banks. But we need to talk a little bit, or not a little bit, a lot about the retrieval. When you are using a soft plastic, talking about your technique. Um, because that, that's, a, that's a big thing. And I think, and you may give me some feedback on this, but I think that that's probably an area where certainly people, when they're first starting out with soft plastics, where people lack confidence. Because they think, am I doing, you know, am I doing the right thing? I mean, you could be tossing some soft plastics out. You're not getting many bites and you just have doubts and you think, you know, am I using the right action? What am I doing? Are there fish there? Are there not fish? So it'd be, it'd be great to get some feedback 
uh, as we start talking about the action. Now, one of the main actions that soft plastic fishermen employ is what's called a lift and pause. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about from my own experience of soft plastic fishing. And hopefully I can explain that to you um, on the camera now. Now, when I, when I throw my line out with a soft plastic, I always put my best cast in. When I, what, I, what I mean by that when I start off with is I always put a reasonably long cast in. The reason I do that is because, like we were talking about earlier, is that we are covering ground. And the more ground I can cover with my soft plastic, the more likelihood I am of locating fish and catching fish. So I will always, if I'm out in the boat or from the shore, I'll put in a really good, nice flick, get my soft plastic out there flying. Um, certainly the light line and the braided lines help us to get distance in that regard. So I'll put in a really good cast. As soon as my plastic hits the water, I wind up the slack so that the line is taut between my rod tip and my, my soft plastic and my jig, my line is taut, it's straight. The reason for that is, if you can imagine, I'm just gonna try and explain this, when your line's gone out, if your line is taut, as it sinks, it, it's like a pendulum. Because if you're restricting, no, no, no more line can go out, you've wound up the slack, it's taut, it naturally must actually come back towards you because you've got the depth of the water. So like a pendulum, your line swings down, but it means that your soft plastic at the end is actually swimming towards you. As opposed to, for example, if you cast your line out, you didn't wind up any slack, you had slack line there. Essentially what would happen is when your plastic um, hit the water, it would hit the water and then it would just flutter to the bottom. Like it would just go straight down like that. Or, you know, head first with the, with the lead, it would just go straight down to the bottom like so. Now, that's not necessarily evil because while that is going down head first with the weight, the tail of the plastic is flickering. And so it's, it's got its action while it's going, but it's going straight down. But when you wind up that slack line and it creates a pendulum effect, what's actually happening is when that, when that plastic hits the water, it actually goes forward. So it's like it's actually swimming forward. So because you, that's why you take up the slack line so that the line is straight and it's taut because then it must, as it drops, it must swim forward. And then you've got that, it's like a fish or a prawn swimming along. And at the same time, you've got whatever tail you're using, whether you're using a wriggler or a grub or one of those paddle tails, all of those ones which have got a really good tail action, because it's swimming forward, <laughs> it's awesome. It's just like the fish is swimming along. It's swimming down towards the bottom on an angle and the tail's work, working beautifully. So I'm always mindful when I throw it out. I wind up the slack line so my line's taut because I want to have that forward action of the plastic as it goes down that it's swimming down on a forward angle. And it's exactly the same throughout the whole length of your cast because once your plastics hit the bottom, you'll pause for a minute. And as you know, if those of you who do soft plastic fishing, that pretty much all the bites happen on the drop. When that thing's going down and as that lure's getting closer to the bottom, where the flathead are, that's when you're gonna get a hit while it's moving like that. And quite often they'll hit it once it's hit the bottom. Um, you'll catch your fish like your brim and pesky tailor and things higher in the water column before it gets near the bottom and then you get your flathead on the bottom. And that's also why we must be patient and let the plastic hit the bottom. We must, we want it to sink to the bottom and hit the bottom. Because if we're fishing for flathead, that's where the fish, the flathead are. The flathead are on the bottom. Now they may well swim up off the bottom if they're lying on the bottom and they see a soft plastic two feet above their head or three feet above their head, they'll come up and they can nail it, they'll swim up off the bottom to get it. But we want our soft plastic to get in that strike zone for the flathead, which really most of the time is a meter off the bottom to the bottom. So 
when we've had our initial cast, that's what we do with our slack line, winding in the slack line, then, I'm just going to move up on my chair, um, then once it's hit the bottom, the lift and pause method is you, you know, a lot of people do a couple of flicks of their rod where you're lifting your soft plastic off the bottom and then you're winding up the slack so that the line's taut again. So really you're rep you're repeating that thing again. So technically, um, I'm trying to use my hand to make the, like you'll pull your soft plastic up and then it'll flutter down to the bottom again. And then you'll pull, you'll, you'll pull it up again and then it'll flutter down to the bottom again. And then you'll pull it up again. So essentially it's like, it's like a zigzag. Oh, this is reverse when I'm doing it in front of the camera. <laughs> technically, you, you get what I'm meaning. It's like the retrieval when you're bringing back in a technique, it's like a zigzag. Now, having said that, that's probably what I do most of the time. I like to lift it up a foot or two off the bottom, wind up the slack so that it's swinging down towards the bottom again. And I have a lot of success. It's great fun doing that i the anticipation anticipation's awesome when you've when you've wound it up and you're waiting for the drop and you're waiting for it to sink because you know very often it's like whoa is this, you get a hit or things whack it um it's a great fun part of fishing with soft plastics but i've got a friend who uh he um, rather than doing like a, a couple of lifts and then winding up the slack he does little little flicks like that he he just flicks it a little bit, winds his rod, and, and he does really tiny little incremental hops of the soft, pl soft plastic across the bottom. Um, I think when you're fishing in sandy areas, that's, that's a really good thing to do. Um, he catches a lot of fish. He I, I pull mine up a little bit further than he does, but he just, he just, just these little hops across the bottom. Um, but in, talk, in me talking about this, I'm just trying to paint the picture for you of when the soft plastic's out there, the reasons what, why we do what we do and how the soft plastics work and the action of the soft plastic. Essentially, you know, you're wanting to have that plastic in the zone where the fish are with, with the lovely action of the tail. Um, and even if you're just doing those little flicks across the bottom, you know, you're creating... Um, interest. Um, I think obviously you get more action from your soft plastic with a higher lift. The only possible negative about that is, let's say for example, you you do a lift with your soft plastic and wind up your slack. So your your lure has been wound up off the bottom. It starts its descent again. It starts going like that again down to the bottom again. But in effect, you've hopped your lure about five feet <laughs> for example like from the, the point where it first hit the bottom and then you've done your lift and your, your lift and wind to get it there and then by the time it swims back down again it's actually hopped five feet from the first place and then another five feet so my friend's method where he does the little flicks um you know you could maybe you can play around with that but you've constantly got the lure uh, acting and moving so before we talk about that any longer, I'm just going to have a, a quick look over at the um, comments again. Um, all right, cool. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you, you're welcome, Peeling Line. Um, happy to answer that question the best way I can. Okay, all right. Talel Tiba, I love your video. Kathy Fremantle. Okay, so um, Kathy says here, yes, please, Roger, the lure action is my problem. So, Kathy, can you tell me in a second, come back on the comments, has what I've been explaining in the last five minutes or so or ten minutes, has that given you a bit of understanding about the lure action? Also, what I'd like to, um, what I'd like to ask all of you out there uh, now at the moment, what is your main um, frustration or what is your greatest um, struggle? What's your greatest struggle 
uh, when it comes to soft plastic fishing? What what don't you really, what, what are you not sure of? If you can maybe, if you've got questions along that line, what your main struggle is, if you can put that over in the comments, that would be great. All right, so I'm just having a look over here. Okay. So scented tentacle said he hasn't used scent all that much. Um, and it hasn't helped him much. I, um, I'm i not opposed to using scent, and I'll probably try using scent. I, I mean, I'm just sharing, just telling you the truth about what I've done um, with scent. Um, okay, just quickly with um, Ricky's comment. A 9.9 .9 horsepower, is a, I, I had one. Uh, last year, I had a little tinny with a 9.9 .9 last year, and... Um, it was it's a cracker. A one to two people with a nine point nine, you can get along pretty good. Um, so I think uh, that size engine is great. I don't think I'd go, go smaller than a nine point nine. I reckon that's um, sufficient. Okay. Okay. So Jeffrey, uh, you've asked, can you also slow troll them from a boat or kayak. Yep, um, that's true. Um, I've um, done that a little bit and I've had friends who've had success or sometimes I know guys when they're in a boat that they'll be fishing with a plastic and they'll just chuck another one out and let it drift along with them um, and you quite often get fish that way so that's a good point Sydney cider okay I'm just gonna put this I fished a lot of slow retrieve soft plastics in Canada for walleye Works wonders. In my opinion, the most important part is the pause after the flick. Okay, well, that's um, thank you for that comment, um, Sydney Cider. That's a good comment because I have I've been thinking about that a little bit more lately in allowing a little bit more time for a pause, not flicking again too quickly. So I think that's a valid point. Ah. Oh. Good on you, mate. <laughs> I um, I guess that's your answer to what your main struggle is. <laughs> there you go. A bit of humour. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, Mother Hen, you're saying that your main problem is a retrieve. Retrieve. Okay. So, we've been talking about that a little bit. Uh, main struggle is bottom debris, weed and rocks. Sydney Cider says, okay, bottom debris, reed and weed and rocks. Um, colours for different coloured waterways and rivers, Adam. Retrieve different colours to use. Okay, all right. So what we might do, um, so we talked about colour just for a second, colours and retrieve. And or then we've got Brian here asking, my biggest question is what size to use. It's amazing how small fish take large soft plastics so we can talk about that a bit size so we're talking about color retrieve uh, size um, okay so let's talk about we've, we've talked about the retrieve a bit um, tell me in a minute if you want me to talk more more about the retrieve but essentially um, the two main methods that people use is what I mentioned was called the lift and pause. And we explained how it's important to wind up the slack line so that you get that nice forward swimming action as the plastic goes back down to the bottom. So in each time you've had lift, that's why you wind up the slack so the line is taut again. And you've got this rolling, you know, as you're coming in, you're pulling it up in the water column, then it's fluttering down. And then you're pulling it up in the water column and then it's fluttering down. And that's probably the, the way that I do it most of the time, and I really like doing that. Um, it's a lot of fun and very successful way to do that. Um, colour. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, thank you for all the uh, uh, comments. I'm enjoying doing this. I, you know, I'm enjoying being able to... Um, help in any way that I can. It's awesome. Um, colors. Okay. I'm on a Facebook group, which is called Flathead Fishing 
Australia or floated fishing in New South Wales. I'm, you know, I'm on a few of those things where I just like to see what people comment. Um, and a lot of guys, you know, in all sorts of posts about flathead, uh, a lot of guys say, look, you know, it doesn't matter what you chuck out. And, and it, to a large extent, it's probably, you know, it's quite incredible the, the variety of colours and things that, that flathead will take. Because, I mean, like I'll give you an example. I've used the nu nuclear chicken colour, which is like fluoro red and green. I've caught lots of fish on nu nuclear chicken. I've used bright orange ones and caught fish on that. I've used the motor oil coloured ones, the Gary Glitter ones. Um, there's another one here I've got, which I'll show you, which has been a great colour, actually. I'll, I'll take it out um, of the packet. This is a this is a Squidgy's Wriggler, um, and this one is oh, it's, it's just because of the green screen. It's a pain. It's actually. Let's see if I can get the color. No, the color's not going to work. Hang on. Oh, it's useless. Look, it's called wasabi. So it's actually look. It, it's the color of wasabi. It's a green color. This wasabi Wriggler. Um, with, with squidgies is a cracker. It works really well. And so that's interesting. That's kind of like a green color. Well, it's a wasabi green color in the Wriggler. So that wasabi green color look, look, works really well. Um, like I mentioned, the kind of glittery ones work really good. A whole range of colors. It's amazing. Like I reckon it's probably true when guys say it almost doesn't matter. So long as you if you've got that thing moving in front of a flathead, he's, he's going to have a go at it. But having said that, I do love my mullet, my mullet impersonations. Um, I find that they work really well. So on that subject, I'm just going to look at the comments for a second here. Right, okay, so Ron says um, his main struggle is not going all the way. With soft plastics, if it wasn't initially getting results, I'd pull out the prawns and and go bait fishing. Um, and John C says I feed them well. Um, you know, it's kind of like you know, like I don't catch fish every time I go. I'll go out with the soft plastics. I mean, pretty much nearly always. Most times you do, but you know, you certainly have times which are better than others and you'll have times when you're out there flicking plastics and you're doing all the right things you're prospecting you're trying different areas you know that your technique is correct um, you know that you're using plastics that consistently catch fish and, and you might be flicking for an hour and, and and you've had almost no hits but look hey that's not the end of I mean, look you know I, I'm never upset Sure, I want to catch fish and I catch heaps, but look, you know, you've got to, you've got to pay the price, haven't you? You've got to put a little bit of time in. Uh, I don't mind doing that. You know, obviously, I want to catch fish, but I don't mind doing that. Uh, Mother Hen says, okay, so Mother Hen says, what color should I use in very dirty water? I think some of those fluoro colors are really good in very dirty water, some of the really bright oranges um, and uh, those nuclear chicken colours are, are great and even things with pink, like bright fluoro pink colours are really good. Um, okay, Michael has uh, put up a question, any thoughts on soft plastics for night fishing? Um, I'm intending to do a little bit of um, Mulloway flicking with the plastics, but the ones the most popular plastics uh, for fishing are the glow, are the glow ones. They're like a white pearl color that glows at night. Um, and definitely, I haven't done any really soft plastic fishing in recent times after dark. I've fished a lot with just still um, answering that question about night. I've fished right until dark lots of times where it's pretty much dark and I can't see the line um, and you're almost going by feel uh, and I have caught flathead and brim 
right on dark. So, I mean, that's pretty much dark and it still worked, still worked fine. Um, all right. Okay. So Adam Dixon says he, I guess using something similar to natural bake colors. Yeah, definitely Adam. And that's why I, I kept mentioning those mullet ones that look like, well, they even like, for example, for snapper, there's soft plastics which are like um, pilchard color, or like like pilchards. Like they're more like a a blue, silvery blue, flecky, and they're very good on snapper. Okay. So mother hen, sorry mother hen, I'm putting this up for you. Um, Nineteen times out of twenty, I don't catch fish. Okay. So mother hen, whereabouts in Australia do you fish? Okay. Uh, then Ron mentions what I heard is try to match the lure color to the water. Yeah, I, st I still think it's, it's a bit of an experiment, isn't it? And I'm not all that knowledgeable about that. I tend to stick to, um, you know, the main half a dozen or so that I usually use, some of the ones which I've been showing you um, tonight. Um, and then I just, when I'm down at the tackle shop, if I look at all the different colors and I see something that looks really cool, uh, that looks like a fish, um, that looks like a natural fish, like you're saying. Um, I will often spend my money and buy them. Um, all right, so yeah, that's right. Yeah, John, John C. I I never have a bad time fishing. I'm just thankful to be out there. I'm glad to be alive. I'm glad to be out there. I love fishing in the rain, anytime. Okay. I'm into beach fishing, picking the plastics to suit the beach. What do you recommend for Taylor salmon and flathead? Um, off the beach, the plastics which look like small fish, that look like um, pilchards or, you know, little mullet and things like that, work really well for the Taylor and salmon, obviously for flathead as well. Um, and the plastics which have got a, a paddle tail, or like a squidgy fish, which has got like a paddle tail, because they've got such a great action, are really good off the beach. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, Brian's made a comment about having a soft tip rod. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, the sort of rods that we're talking about using are, are only light anyway. They're relatively soft tip. Um, you wouldn't want it too stiff, I don't think. And yeah, I mean, we're we're really wanting to get the soft plastics in in the vicinity in the strike zone where the fish are, and then just impart that action to it. Ultraviolet colours for midnight, Stelios. Okay, so Stelios, have you used them at midnight with success? Uh, where is a good all-round? White is a good all-round colour. Okay, I'm just going to put that one up. That's actually, that's a good point. I've got a friend who lives uh, at Newport Beach in Sydney, and he fishes pit water, and he just uses white soft plastics. And he's caught heaps of flathead and fish, and he just uses white nemesis, I think, or kind of a nemesis style soft plastic. So um, that's a good comment, Jeffrey. Thank you for that. Okay, so we've got Thelema. It's good to have a few options, variations, so you can try three or four different types if one isn't working. Not that I'm an expert, but I've had luck changing colour. Yeah, no, that's a great comment. I, I generally when I go soft plastic fishing, I take at least three or four different plastics. And often if I'm fishing with someone else, we'll each have a different soft plastic on just to see if someone's getting more success than the other person. So that's a good point. Now I'm just going to go back to my notes. Okay. All right. So we've talked a fair bit or a reasonable amount about 
the action of the soft plastic when you cast out. So first of all, we talked about the action, and then I also mentioned about how I like to get in a longer cast because I'm just covering more ground if I'm casting a longer cast. And then we also talked about casting, you know, prospecting not casting in the same spot. Like if you're standing on the shore, you're going to cover that area of, of ground in front of you a good 10, 15 metres either side of you. And then if you've had no action there, move. Move along to the next spot. Okay, so my next uh, topic here, down the bottom, number six, it says cover your ground, which is really what we just sort of saying there. I said here in cover your ground, uh, and just to remind you also, if um, you didn't come on at the beginning, I mentioned how I have these notes as a download, uh, as a PDF document. And that's what this link is uh, on the screen. So you can hopefully click that link or copy it, type it into your um, browser, and you can download my uh, soft plastic uh, notes. Um, so, all right. So... Yep, so undercover your ground here, I've just said in my notes, do not continually cast in the same spot if you are not getting any bites. I think that's good advice <laughs> when it comes to soft plastics anyway. We locate fish by casting in different directions until we have success. Okay, we locate fish by casting in different directions until we have success. Make sure that you work an area to find the fish, and it's like that. Um, I know in the lake where I live, if I'm in my boat and I'm and I just am stationary, I'm flicking around the boat. I might I might only move 50 meters in the boat. I'll move along 50 meters or so, and then I'll just flick. I'll stand on the boat. And I'll just work my way around the boat, flicking in different directions. Um, and I'll work my way along an area where there's a weed bank, where it drops off, where there's a weed bank uh, flowing onto sand, uh, where the weeds, where it drops off from the weed to the sand into the deeper water. And I'll fish along that corridor, um, right up along the edge of the weeds. I'll try casting a little bit out into the deeper water, but then I, like, I want to fish that corridor where the, re where the weeds meet the sand. Um, and if I'm land-based fishing, uh, often you'll need to wade out into the water, depending on how far out the drop-off is. You might have to walk out waist deep in the water because otherwise you might not be getting your soft plastics in the area where the fish are, in the zone where the fish are. So you've got to be prepared to get wet. Put Have some um, plastic shoes or something that you can wear in the water. Protect your feet. And just make sure that if you're fishing from the shore and you've got a weed bank in front of you, that you know that you're going to have at least a reasonable amount of time with your soft plastic working that area of sandy bottom leading up to the weeds. And then I said here, um, you know, when you're prospecting an area, if you have no interest, move your position and keep trying. And typically, typically that's what I do um, when I'm soft plastic fishing. Um, and I'm just going to move over to the comments again uh, for a second. I don't know. I've got no idea what time it is. I haven't even looking, been looking at the clock to see what time it is. There you go. It's um, nearly nine o'clock. Okay. All right. Fishing Maniac, East Coast Australia. I'm located on the South Coast. I used to live in Sydney. I've been living down here for three years on the South Coast. It's amazing. But, I mean, I had so much fun, fun in Northern Beaches. Really good fishing in Sydney. Really good fishing in the Northern Beaches. Okay. Um, okay. Not dead. Okay, which is better for brim, small little blades or soft plastics? Um, Mr. Not Dead, I, have, I've, I haven't used many blades 
yet. That's something I haven't done a lot of fishing. Um, so I can't, I can't comment because I don't use blades a lot at this point, although I'd like to uh, start adding some. Um, but certainly on the small soft plastics, um, I, I catch a lot of brim um, on the soft plastics. Heaps. Okay, so I'll just come down here. Okay, DX Gamer, 8.55 p.m. here. Okay. Thanks, thanks only for 4.45 a.m. Oh. Only 4.55 a.m. Sunday here. Wow, where are you? Mr. NJ Fishing, where are you? Okay, all right. Yep. So, not dead here says for tailor only real fast, or they won't really be tempted to eat. I don't really want to catch the tailor. <laughs> I try to avoid tailor. I don't think they're evil. I just um, I use them for bait. Um, I have been smoking tailor in recent times, and I was really shocked at how good they were smoked. So, um, you know, but generally I don't overly focus on them. Phil Todd, what knot do you tie the line to the lure? Um, Phil, I still use that really basic knot, which is what the, uh, what's it called? I've got a um, video on YouTube on it. I did, a, I did a knot video on YouTube of the knot that I use, and that's the only knot I use um, most of the time. I think it's called a improved clench knot. But if you look on my channel, on my YouTube channel, um, there's a knot video. So um, you'll be able to see exactly. The, and that's the one that I use when I tie my soft plastics on. Essentially, you put your hook through the eye, um, you wrap it around the line about five times, put the tag back in through the loop near the hook and then back through the other loop. Pull it. I always wet it with my saliva and then slide it down. It's a really basic knot, but I've never had any trouble with it. So, all right. So, okay. Okay, so just a comment from Sydney Cider about the night. Um, soft plastics it says you can use needle head glow sticks and insert them into the soft plastics to get a constant glow. Okay, I've also seen LED lures in Canada, but not sure if they are legal here. LED, mm. I'm not sure, maybe. All right, okay, and just a reminder that um, my membership website, Rogers Fishing, is open. Hasn't been open for the last couple of months, but we're open for new members. And I would really encourage you to come and join and join our fishing family. Um, we've got some great members who are very helpful. And I do a fortnightly Zoom. Every two weeks I do uh, a Zoom. Well, I guess it's like this. Um, and normally I will have a topic that I'm teaching on in the Zoom. And then we have like an open Q&A um, with the Zoom. Uh, so we do that fortnightly, um, and that's one of the benefits of being a member. You have that Zoom uh, where you can uh, ask me questions and also there's other people involved in the Zoom who uh, add to that with a lot of their experience as well. Um, and then I have the fishing courses uh, on Rogers Fishing as well and our private membership group, which is exactly like a Facebook group, but it's a private group. Um, where we can um, share our successes and uh, share information um, in that group. Okay, so uni knot. Adam Dixon has said 8.30 p.m. here in South Australia. Okay. Um, okay, Jeffrey Morford says he does the same thing with the glow sticks. Adam mentions a uni knot. I use a double uni knot for tying leaders. I think that, that, that works pretty well. I haven't put time into using an FG knot uh, and becoming proficient at the FG knot. I believe the greatest advantage of an FG knot is that it's, it's such a fine knot that it just flows through your runners. There's no hindrance um, in having a bulky knot 
going through the uh, the runners on your rod. That's the huge advantage of an FG knot, but it's time consuming to make. But I find that the double uni knot uh, trims down really well and is really strong. And I find that's what I I use a double uni knot for tying my um, fluorocarbon to braid. All right, so. All right, so I was just going to put this up for you guys. Um, Ron says here, also, Roger, don't know if you covered it, but braid is the best for soft plastics. My old school dad tried to use mono, but it wasn't as good as braid. You, the main advantages of using braid is because of its thin diameter, you can cast much further. And the other advantage is because it doesn't have stretch or flexibility like mono has stretch in it, you feel every little tap on the line. It's ultra sensitive. You just didn't. You just need to, uh, when you're playing fish with braid, you just need to be a little bit more patient, and not put as much pressure on. You know, let your rod do the work because, because of the less the the fact of lack, lack of stretch in braid, you can potentially that rigidness of it can aid in pulling hooks out of a fish. So you you can't what the old guys would call skull drag a fish, like, yeah, um, because you could potentially lose it. So you've got to be a little bit more patient. So um, thank you for that, Ron. Okay, not yet. I've only... Okay, all right. So so not dead is he's in Perth. Okay. All right. Mandurah. Uh, it would be good to know a little bit more about the, you know, how uh, what the flathead fishing is like in general in uh, in South Australia. Sorry, in Western Australia. Um, if uh, if they are as prolific as they are in other states. All right. Okay, I'm just going to put this one up. This question for a second. Hi, Roger. Your YouTube video, deadliest rig with a stinger hook and why trace that you made. Can you do a shopping list of the items and where you got them from? Cheers, Steve. That's actually a, a good, that's a great rig, that deadliest rig, because one of the problems when you're fishing off the beach using fish baits is being bitten off by tailor and sharks. And using the deadliest rig with the wire eliminates that and it doesn't stop you from catching other fish. Um, I found it, you know, brim, everything, even whiting. <laughs> I've caught on it, on it. So, um, okay, so the shopping list, um, I bought from the Complete Angler, which is a fishing chain. I bought um, the wire. The brand of the wire was Icon, I-C-O-N. So I bought that from the Complete Angler. I also bought the little sleeves that go on the wire from Complete Angler, and that brand was Jinkai. Uh, the little sleeves. Um, I think most fishing tackle shops have this habit, have that stuff. Might not necessarily be the same brand, but they have it. So the components are purely the wire, the little sleeves that you crimp onto the wire, and essentially at one end, you put the wire through the sleeve, through your swivel, back through the sleeve, crush it on. The other end goes through the sleeve, through the eye of the hook, back through the sleeve, crush it on. So you really got swivel, hook, wire, and little crimps. Okay. Okay, so Rare Aussie says, I use a loop knots in all my lure fishing. Um, I, I, I guess I need to be educated in that area, um, Rare Aussie. Um, and um, I do have a book on knots that has loop knots in it. So do you do that with your with your soft plastics as well, Rear Rosy? Okay. Adam asks a question, is fluorocarbon the, carbon the same as mono? No, it's not the same. It's a different material. Uh, there is a variety of different fluorocarbons. Some of them are called easy casting. In the early days of fluorocarbon, I tried spooling some of my reels just with fluorocarbon 
because I thought then I don't even have to think about litres. I can just put straight six pound or eight pound fluorocarbon on. But when I had did that, I found some of the brands of fluorocarbon was very stiff, almost like straw. I didn't like it. So I didn't bother putting straight fluorocarbon on. It, it's not as supple as mono. Uh, you can use it. I mean, so, I mean there might be better quality um, casting fluorocarbons out there now. Okay, Sydney Soldier says, Soldier says, I use the improved clinch knot as well. Okay, yeah, that's what it is. That's the one that I use. Uh, okay. All right, just another reminder about my um, notes that I prepared for you tonight. Um, they're there for your benefit um, if you want to download them. It's just a PDF document. It just covers some of the basics of that uh, what we've been talking about tonight. All right, all right, so just looking here. Okay. Okay. So, Rare Rossi, you said that, yes, you um, do that. I think I can remember from the last time you were on one of these, um, the last time I did a live, you were a rod builder. Were you a rod builder? Is that, I think you're a rod builder. Anyway, there you go. Um Okay, so Sydney Cider, Adam says that fluorocarbon has smaller diameter and same strength as mono. Okay, all right, well, that's a bit of um, good information. And if you can buy a better quality fluorocarbon, you could consider having some light fluorocarbon on a, and try that. Okay. SMC says that he uses, uh, they use loop knots as well. The theory is that it allows the plastic to move more naturally. Yeah, I can see. I can. I can see that. That makes sense. Yeah, I can see that. Thank you for explaining that. All right. So Adam says thanks for all the great content tonight, Roger. Keep up the great word, great video content. Thanks a lot, Adam. Um, it's enjoyable. It's enjoyable talking, uh, discussing this stuff. And I, and I think it's helpful to all of us. I, I'm, I'm benefiting by uh, your comments tonight, which is fantastic. Now, I'm just going to, for those, for those of you who are considering joining Rogers Fishing, becoming part of our, our fishing family, I'm just going to quickly click over to a, a small little presentation that I've done on that. It's really short. It's only just for a few minutes. And then I'll come straight back after that. So I'm just going to do that now and back, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Oh, there I am looking at the bottom. Okay, so anyway, you have all of the gear, but you need knowledge and strategy. And we know that ongoing mentoring is critical, or really ongoing relationship. We all need good fishermen that we can hang around and learn from. So what is the best way to do this? Well, really, that's why I'm introducing you to Rogers Fishing, my Rogers Fishing membership. And here I've just got a, a short testimonial down below recently of one of my members. He says, thanks for sharing this about one of my videos. He said, for those considering joining Rogers Fishing, don't hesitate. It's such a fantastic resource and an authentic fishing community full of awesome resources. That's such a great testimony. I really appreciate that. And uh, it's great to know that people are really benefiting from being a member of Rogers Fishing. So how do we get there? How do you become a member of Rogers Fishing? When you consider the cost of one-on-one -on -one beach swimming lessons or fishing coaching, and fishing guiding, it's quite expensive, but also it's quite limiting because I can only really spend uh, not much time with people uh, in as much as if I can go fishing with one person for a day, it really limits uh, my ability to help people. However, through Rogers Fishing and by creating quality content and really good resources and a helpful community, 
I can help a lot more people. So I'd like to introduce you to Rogers Fishing if you haven't already heard about it. So with Rogers Fishing, what I do is I do a fortnightly Zoom Q&A session, which means that you can join me uh, every fortnight or as often as you like, and you can actually ask me questions in person. And in these Zoom sessions, I normally teach on a specific topic. So first of all, I will do some teaching and then we'll open it up for general discussion. So those Zoom sessions are really good and it's like an online ongoing coaching. Um, I have created my Beach Fishing Masterclass course, which includes 15 videos uh, and is a great foundational course on beach fishing. Also includes my Beach Worming Masterclass course, which has three videos plus the only book in Australia on beach worming, which I wrote a few years ago. And you become part of our private membership group which is, it's just like a Facebook group, but it's not Facebook and it's private, uh, which is much better. And also, as time goes by, the library of content is growing and I'm writing new fishing, fishing courses as we speak. I'm creating an estuary fishing course, teaching about the basics of estuary fishing for species like brim, flathead whiting, and even mulloway. Okay. This is just a quick look at my beach fishing course, um, my beach fishing masterclass. It has a number of modules, all with videos. Uh, it's just some examples here of some of the modules that are in uh, Rogers Fishing Beach Fishing course. And obviously, number five, choosing your location is a big one. Also, now, what does it cost to become a member of Rogers 15? It's Rogers 15, Rogers Fishing. It's $19.90 per month. There's no lock-in contract, and you have instant access to all of the resources of Rogers Fishing, which includes my fishing courses, which I sell as standalone courses as well. My beach fishing course, my beach fishing masterclass, sells for $179, but that course you have immediate access as soon as you join Rogers Fishing. So technically, you could join for a month and pay $19.90 and have that nearly $200 course. Although I recommend, obviously, that you don't just uh, become a member for a month. And I wanted to make the membership easy and low cost for people. So now we're just going to move back into our live Q&A session. Just coming back to camera now. And um, there you go. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm learning about technology all the time. So, okay, I'm back in the chat. So, yeah, I just was explaining about Rogers Fishing uh, and the benefits of being a member and uh, the low cost for that. So hope, hope to see more of you coming and joining us. Okay, so back over to the comments. We've got... Okay. So Rick says, thanks Roger from South Australia. Please can you get an get a FG knot tool, which makes it a lot easier to tie cheese. PS, you can get an FG knot tool. Okay. Thanks, Rick. I'll have to have a look into that. Warren um, says, great content and courage, mate. Thanks. Thank you very much, Warren. Appreciate that. Sydney Cider. He also uses loop knots for squid lures but not for soft plastics. Okay, the benefit of loops is they can allow more action and movement in the lure. I don't think soft plastics need the loops, in my opinion. Okay, cool. Thanks, Sydney Side. I do a little bit of, uh, lots of squid where I live. I'm actually keen to go and get some um, for eating and for bait. All right, so what have we got here? So Not Dead says, when... We go flatty fishing, it has to be perfect in Manjura to catch flatty, but when it's perfect, you catch like five. Uh, bike specific doesn't how big is your biggest flathead. Also, it has to be specific goes and how big was your biggest flathead? My biggest flathead at the moment is only 88. 
So I haven't cracked 90 centimetres yet. I actually, I had, a, I had a fish on about two weeks ago. I had it at my feet. Um, and I was just enjoying watching it. I had this, I had a massive, and I reckon it was, well, we'd previously, my friend caught a 91 centimetre one a few days before. Uh, and this fish, which was at my feet, looked bigger than his 91 centimetre fish. Uh, I, wa I wanted to at least measure it, but when I had it at my feet, the line got caught around the side gill of its head, and it was amazing how much energy it had for a huge fish. This thing looks looked much longer than his 90 centimetre fish. But sadly, I didn't get the opportunity of measuring it because when it turned, my line got nicked and I and it just took off at pace and just and off it went um, so that was definitely a 90 but it could have been a meter it could, could have been a meter it was definitely 90 centimeters to a meter that fish but I didn't actually catch it but as as to um, the biggest I've landed and measured is 88 centimeters all right so I'm just gonna go over here all right edit suite says please give us a thumb up if you haven't already cool the green screen yeah that's it the green screen <laughs> I think um, hopefully the next time I do one of these I'm a little bit um, yeah I learn a little bit more about the technology it's been a bit of a just an interesting learning curve because you know obviously I'm a fisherman <laughs> so learning to, how to operate some of this stuff um, and doing YouTube lives, but I'm, I'm feeling a little bit more at home with it. So I think um, as time goes by and I do more live teachings on YouTube, I think um, the technology side of things will improve and uh, hopefully my content is good. All right, so... Okay, how fast should you allow the lure to sit? Well, like how long, what you're saying, SMC, is how long do you pause once your soft plastics hit the bottom? I think really you'd only count to five, probably. You know, maybe ten at the most, but probably count to five when it's hit the bottom. And then either do the little flicks across the bottom or do the lift wind up the slack and then allow it to swim back down again. All right, so... Okay, so Rick has made a comment. He said fluorocarbon sinks and mono floats or is more buoyant. Okay. There you go. Well, that's good, I think, from a soft plastic point of view. If it sinks better than mono, that's good. Although I think pretty much everyone uses fluorocarbon leader nowadays. Um, Ron, I haven't caught one on soft plastics yet. I've just caught them on bait. But I have uh, purchased some soft plastics and I'm all ready to go. So I, c I can give you some feedback once I start catching some on soft plastics. Um, okay, so Jean says, have ever heard of the trilene knot? No, I haven't. I'm not, I don't know what the trilene knot is. be interesting to find out. Okay, DX Gamer says, how long will this go for tonight? I think we're probably pretty close to um, uh, bringing it to end because I think that, you know, unless you guys have got more questions, um, I think we've covered a fair bit of ground tonight. Do you agree? Um in this subject does anyone do you guys have any more questions or any other topics you'd like to bring up before we wind up for the evening okay all right so Brian has said here I'm a member of Rogers fishing group it's great and I learn a lot of different techniques that I used over east compared to here in the west thank you Brian I really appreciate that not dead. Can you tell me what to look for when... Oh, sorry, not dead. I'll put that up. Okay.
the places that I go squidding are mainly off the rocks. And the places where the squid are are around kelp beds and over kelp beds. Um, where you've got the weedy kelp beds on the bottom, you want to obviously have rocky areas with kelp. Um, that That's the sorts of areas that I fish off the rocks for squid. And when you are squidding off the rocks, you let your squid jig sink to the bottom. I know that sounds like you're going to get snagged and lose your squid jig, but you, you, you don't really. You rarely lose a jig. But you'll get a lot more hits from squid near the bottom than you will if you leave your squid jig high in the water column. You've got to risk potentially losing your squid jig and let it get down low because the squid more often are down low, down near the bottom, near the kelp, because they're not up in the middle of the water column where they are easy prey for fish. So that's just a little tip when you're jigging for squid off the rocks. Rare Aussie, you would think you had been doing years of the shows. You're amazing in what you do. Hey, um, thanks heaps, mate. You're a legend. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I did, like I, I mentioned before, I, I'm becoming a little bit more um, relaxed <laughs> with it. Um, it's more around the technology and getting used to the technology. Um, it's like anything. The more you do it, you know, you sort of get you get a little bit more at home with it. But I appreciate your um, feedback. Okay. Yeah, I remember, Jeffrey, when I was uh, younger, in my teenage years, I used to fish for Luderick a lot. And a lot of guys used to put Vaseline on their line when they fished for Luderick so that their lines, uh, it would float and stay on the surface. And there's lots of garfish in Burrill Lake where I live, heaps of garfish. And I know a couple of guys who fish for them all the time. I haven't uh, focused on that yet because um, I've just got other things that I would rather do at the moment in fishing in the lake and fishing off the beach and fishing for snapper and, and different things uh, that are my focus at the moment. Okay. CJ is just asking a question, is Trialene not a weedless style one? I don't know about that. Okay, Steve has said, hi Roger, if you get a few fish, how is your method of keeping or preserving fish for a few days? <clears throat> Steve, I am a butcher by trade. So I did my apprentice, when I left school, my first job was a butcher, so I was all about cutting up meat and storing meat. But um, all I do, you know, I, I, tr I fillet my fi fish as soon as possible just to make things easier. If I can, I fillet them before I take them home. Then they, don't, they take up less room in the fridge. But, you know, if you catch your fish, take it home, put it in the fridge, it's good for five days, no problem. You can, you know, it's not... It's going to be fine for five days. Really, probably the first one to three days is optimal uh, if you're not freezing it and keeping it fresh. But certainly, you know, if you've had a fish in the fridge and it's been cool and it's been put in the fridge, uh, in the fridge uh, early, it hasn't been outside for too long, um, no problem. Three or four days, easy. Uh, just once you start getting, you don't really want to go past five days, I don't think. <clears throat> okay. Um, David, I make my own burley. Um, I know you can buy it frozen. I'm not against doing that, um, but generally I I keep all my leftover bait. I keep my leftover pilchards. I don't chuck away things. I just um, keep it so that I can use it for burley on my next trip. Um, <clears throat> Rare Aussie, I was thinking of doing another live in about three weeks. Um, the last one I did was a good couple of months ago. It was before Christmas. So I'm thinking I'm just going to do another one soon, partly because it'll help me get um, 
in the flow with the technology a bit more. If I, if I, because otherwise I find that in this case where I've done a live only every, every couple of months, it's like I, I forget some of the technology stuff. So, yep, so I'm going to do one really soon. I've just got to choose a relevant topic, um, something that's going to be, uh, that people are interested in. <clears throat> Is there a big difference between expensive squid jigs? No, I've bought some of the cheap ones. You know, you know how they have in the tackle shops. So they'll have like a bin with a whole bunch of them, uh, five bucks each or something. They've worked fine. I, I've used the expensive ones and the cheap ones, and and the cheap ones have worked just as good. So, Trevor Bennett's. Okay, Trevor's got some info about the fluorocarbon. He says very light fluorocarbon line does float up to six pound or so. The heavier fluoro will start to sink, yes. I use four pound for lures, no problem with sinking. Okay, all right. Brian has just um, reminding us to gut your fish if you're not using it straight away. Yep, remove those ugly guts out of the fish. Jake Withy. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this up. I made one of your glass bowl and net and the guppy fish traps. Tested it today and it worked a treat. The kids loved it and I caught a flatty and a flat fish. Cool, that's awesome, Jake. I've been using those glass things for like, gosh, probably 40 years I've been using a glass bowl uh, as a mullet trap. As I mentioned in the video, I like the fact that you don't have to put sinkers in it because when you use plastic bottles and things, you've got to put lead weights or something in there to stop it from floating around. But the glass bowls are awesome. Okay... Thanks for the tip. Um, edit suite, Rogers Fishing Doors open, close in 48 hours. There you go. Um, thank you, John. Much appreciated. It's awesome. All right, so Amy Joy. Fantastic. That's so cool. Once you've um, once you've done that, you know that thing. Then you you can use it whenever you want to catch live mullet, uh, whenever you go on holidays or if you go fishing near where you live. That's great to hear, Amy. Thank you. Ah, Jeffrey's got a suggestion. Next one should be mullet way fishing. Ah, cool. Okay, it's good to get suggestions. So let's have a look. We'll see about that. <coughs> Peeling line. Is live bait your preferred method of fishing? It's just one method for me, peeling line. It's it's not necessarily my preferred method. It's just, I love it all. Um, I like it, if you're fishing for bait for flathead, it's great. It's good for mulloway. Uh, if you're fishing for kingfish, live bait, it just, the answer to that is it just depends on what you, what you're fishing for, whether you use live bait or not. Okay, all right, now, <clears throat> okay, so I'd like to thank all of you guys for um, your company tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm glad that you've been part of this live. And, you know, I can tell by the comments that um, it's a productive thing. It's a good thing. And uh, there's some, the main thing is that there's good information. And that's, uh, well, really, that's my my purpose in putting things together is to get is to have quality information and share it in a way that's actually able to be understood because uh, that's the whole important thing with teaching is that the person being taught can actually grasp what's being taught and then apply it so yeah so thank you very much everybody <clears throat> thank you smc um i think i will be saying good night. So good night, everybody. And I look forward to seeing you
in a few weeks when I do the next live. And make sure that you check out rogersfishing.com and consider becoming one of our fishing family. I'll see you soon. Good night, everybody.